Okay, get ready for a pretty amazing story that includes this judge, Judge Leslie Alden, putting me in jail for contempt of court as part of my divorce case. And she gave me a one-year sentence. Now, the instant I stepped into the courtroom and saw her, I knew I was dead in the water. So we'll get back to this. Okay, time to get a glass of wine or your favorite beverage. Sit back, relax, get ready for an amazing story. As some of you know who have been following this, my 24-year-old daughter, Maddie, has come out with a, another video telling the world that I abandoned the family. Can you kind of explain a little bit of the controversy? Of course. Okay, so for anybody who is listening who doesn't know me, which is probably most people because I'm literally not famous. Nah, millions of followers. Unfortunately, though, I have become semi-famous literally just in like Republican hate circles. Most recently, I made a video about my dad because my dad abandoned my family when I was little and he like went on to become a pretty famous break dancer. And I made a video that was like very funny tongue in cheek about that. But because my dad is like a huge Republican, huge Bitcoiner, like he's so bizarre. He has this sort of cultish following around him god <laughs> and in the sh in the video that he posted he's like wearing a bitcoin t-shirt he has an american flag behind him like he's like oh and then elon musk responded to my dad's video being like you're awesome like you're an awesome dad you're awesome so that got all of the elon musk fans after me it was sort of just a whole controversial moment in my life so this should be your screenplay right Kurt went super viral etc cetera, etc cetera. but she added that he wouldn't pay her medical bills then comes ben stage name benny hana with a 10 minute reaction video and some pretty good natured corrections he claimed he lived close by after the divorce did pay medical bills child support put money into a college fund to the tune of around five $5 million dollars all in all to cover the cost of the kids and said he saw his kids often when they were growing up but he did admit that from his daughter's perspective as a five-year-old it might seem like abandonment but that in his opinion it was not a totally accurate account whilst we watch his father-daughter union play out in real time obviously elon musk weighs in to tell ben you're awesome i didn't even know but this has got me thinking ben is getting absolutely dragged online with people calling him a deadbeat dad and like loads of other grim stuff are these internet call outs fair i've seen these happen time and time again and it always turns out that there's another side to the story. Would we feel differently if Ben was less of a comic character or was just like less good natured about the whole thing? Would she still have posted it if she knew he was going to see it? But whatever your thoughts are on internet call outs, I think we can all agree with this comment. Benny Hanna does unfortunately go so crazy. But this like breakdancing dad stuff, it's so bizarre and it's so ridiculous and like yeah, like I literally am writing a screenplay about it. Like, and I've been working on that screenplay for like months. How do you like tolerate this? Do you just like block it out? The dad stuff is the worst because it's like my actual real life. Yeah. So honestly, the dad controversy has been the hardest to deal with yeah. because like it is hard having people in my comments who don't know anything being like, your dad is awesome. So I need to supply more information about this saga. Information that Maddie and the kids probably have not heard before. As I've said, I don't really blame my daughter for these very inaccurate videos that she's been putting out. I put the blame on her mom, my ex-wife, Betsy. Now let me recap what's happened so far for those of you who have missed it. Then we'll delve deeper into some of the crazier stuff that I've skipped over. Okay, here's a quick recap. Okay, I wake up at 6 a.m. to do some work. I get my coffee. I sit down. I open my computer. And what am I greeted with? Well... Hundreds of comments calling me a deadbeat dad, a child abandoner, and all manner of other insults. So I think, what's this all about? Well, after a few minutes of investigation, I discover that my daughter, Maddie, has made a video about me. She's a screenwriter in Hollywood. She's also a big social media influencer. Some of her videos get millions of views. And this video has 1 million likes, 20,000 comments, 40,000 bookmarks, 30,000 reposts. So I thought I'd better watch this video. And frankly, I was pretty chagrined by what I heard, to say the least. My dad abandoned my family when I was five years old. That is um, a wife and four kids. He abandoned us and then pursued amateur breakdancing. Became like the oldest actively competing breakdancer in the world. Here, I'll show you. To see, take a look at this 60 year old breakdancer. Yes, 60 years old. Amazing. That's Ben Hart. He's competing at a breakdancing competition in Philadelphia. This guy wouldn't pay my medical bills. That is not true. 
Almost everyone I knew had seen this video and was asking me about it. Now I told Maddie I liked 98% of her video, but that there were some significant inaccuracies in there, like about me not paying medical bills. That's just not true. And the implication was that I was some kind of deadbeat dad. I paid her mom millions of dollars in alimony, child support, put hundreds of thousands of dollars into the kids' college funds, paid for the health insurance, of course, and out-of-pocket medical costs, as I should have. The result was that the kids were able to live in a wealthy suburb of Chicago, attend top colleges, and pursue very good careers. Anyways, I asked Maddie to take down her video and at least correct the damaging inaccuracies. It just wasn't true that I wasn't covering medical costs. I told her almost everyone I know had seen it, including clients. It had the potential to hurt my business, hurt me professionally. And some key parts of her video just aren't true. And I certainly don't think she meant any harm by her first video. But she declined to take down her video because she said her video had gone viral. It was everywhere. So she didn't want to take it down. So I came back a day or so later and told her that I had posted a response video on X. I told her the video response was very mild and very positive. It just corrects a couple of inaccuracies. And at that point, my video on X only had a few hundred views. She watched my video and seemed to like it, thought it was funny. So then I suggested, since you aren't going to take down your video and correct it, I would at least like you to post my response video on your feed. But she declined. So I really had no choice but to put up my response video to set the record straight, even if it only gets 200 views, which is about what I expected. Well, then my response video really started to blow up. It hit 1 million views in about 12 hours, then 5 million views, 10 million views, 20 million views, and on up from there. Maddie's mom started to freak out, sent me long text messages telling me to take my video down. I'm like, but Maddie's video is still up and has 7 million views, and that's just on TikTok. Plus, Maddie has posted a much more negative second video, full of inaccuracies. Now, I don't blame Maddie at all for any of this. She's just repeating the brainwashing and propaganda that she's been hearing from her mom for the last 19 years. Okay, so anyways, let's take a look at Maddie's follow-up video. I know my dad posted like a 10-minute video or whatever being like, you know, my daughter's lying. We have a great relationship. I have a great relationship with all my kids. That's just objectively not true. Like guys, we're all freaking out about this in my family group chat right now. We're being like, he's so unhinged and delusional. We don't know if he actually believes his own narrative or if he's lying on purpose, but he's just like a weird guy. Yeah, he said he lived down the street from us. That's not true. Or like if he did, it was only for a few months maybe, but I don't want to get into this. Like again, like my video was basically like sanitizing the situation and like poking fun at the lightest parts of that childhood trauma. But obviously, in real life it was a lot more like complicated and traumatic and it was really hard he left us immediately married another woman we didn't hear from him for years and then he would visit every few months and we'd go out to dinner but like he truly had no hand in raising us at all he gave us some money growing up i like i honestly don't know the nitty-gritty of the financial situation I, I really really don't bottom line is this guy was a completely absent father completely absent father okay so let's roll tape to see what childhood was actually like for my kids and let's see how my relationship was with the kids even after the divorce and even after very ugly legal proceedings. We have with us here Maddie Hart. She is a YouTube specialist. How many, how many videos, Maddie, do you have on YouTube now? About you 54. Say? And what is your goal? One day I want to be a partner. What does that mean? It means you get paid to make videos. Yeah. So what are your reflections on the day? Um, it was pretty good, except for this really mean lady. <laughs> that was a mean lady, yeah. But uh, we took care of her. It cost me right. five dollars. Okay, um, any reflections on the day, Victoria? No. Uh, what did you get? What kind of ice cream did you get? Oh, I didn't get ice cream. We got funnel cake instead. You got what? Funnel cake. Funnel cake? Wow, that's pretty good. All right, so how would you summarize the day at the water park? It was pretty good. That lady was funny. How would you rate it? 
a nine out of ten? Where where do you think it fell short? And if you'd like to see the first two videos on this saga, I've linked to those below. Now honestly, I thought I had overcome all this brainwashing of the kids by my ex-wife. I thought I had a great relationship with my daughters, especially since they became adults. Everything was going fine, I thought. Here we were last Christmas, 90 days ago. We all had a great time. I even thought I was getting along fine with my ex-wife, Betsy. Just last year, I swung by her house to pick up the kids for dinner. One of the kids was late, was out with a friend or something, so Betsy invited me to come into the house for a glass of wine. Three of the kids were there, and we had a perfectly fine conversation, perfectly pleasant. Then the kids and I went out for dinner, and we all had a great time as usual. I thought the fact that Betsy had invited me into her house for a glass of wine was good progress. I was encouraged. But now this saga has taken a more negative turn, and all the indicators point to my ex-wife, Betsy, as the manipulator, as the well poisoner. In every video that Maddie puts out, she says I abandoned the family. And none of my daughters are talking to me right now. Only my son Peter is talking to me. So I think I need to tell a more complete story. A story that the kids have never heard before. I have really two goals with this video. Number one, I think this information might help a lot of dads out there to avoid some of the mistakes that I've made. Whether you were recently divorced, or not yet divorced. I say not yet divorced because about half of marriages end in divorce. And about 50% of married couples who are not yet divorced, well, their marriages are hanging by a thread. Goal number two. My kids have never heard the whole story of what happened. They've heard one side. One side from their mom, Betsy, my ex-wife. And I think it's been a very distorted story and a very incomplete story. Now, I'm not going to get into all that led to the divorce who cheated on who, and who cheated first. Let's just say there were a lot of factors that created a very unstable marriage. And we can get into that later if Betsy wants to. But I'm just going to talk here about what happened after the separation in 2004 and the divorce in 2005, because I made every mistake possible. I basically did not protect myself legally at all. First off, I gave Betsy 97% of the family assets and left myself with 3%, which actually left me with zero because the 3% I had was quickly consumed by the lawyers. I did this because I knew I had a business and I could build back up. And of course, I wanted the kids to feel secure, to let them know that they would have nothing to worry about financially. And money is just not something I've ever been very concerned about. I knew I could always make money. At any rate, after I posted my first video in response to Maddie's video, Betsy wrote me a long text message full of invective, asking why I was using exaggerated numbers in terms of what I paid for alimony, child support, college costs, and the other costs over the years. Then I had this text conversation with my oldest daughter, Tori. 
I said, hey, Tori, give me a call when you get a chance. Tori answered, quote, hi, Dad, I love you, but not right now. It's time for me to cut off communication. The video you posted was full of lies and just dragging Mom and Maddie 20 years after the fact, and you're just letting that happen. I'm distancing myself for the time being, end quote. I answered, quote, my video was not full of lies. Maddie posted an attack on me that my client saw. I had no choice but to answer. I asked Maddie to take her video down. She refused because it was going viral. I was trending on TikTok. I asked her to post my video on her feed, which is an accurate video. She liked my video, thought it was funny, but declined. So I posted it on my feed because everyone had seen Maddie's video. So I had to answer. I answered in the nicest, low-key way possible. But then I started thinking, what are all these supposed lies that Tori is talking about? Tori is a good person. She must think there are lies in my video. And Maddie has put up at least four videos now where she continues to say that I abandoned the family, which I believe that I've proven is not true at all. And the problem is my kids have no clue what the real story is. Now what some people in the comments are saying is, why put all this on video for public viewing? Well, because the girls are not talking to me right now. And the only way to deliver information to them is to put it up on video. Now perhaps the so-called lie that Tori is referring to, and that Betsy is referring to, is the approximately $2 million lump sum that Betsy received at the end of the marriage, at the start of the divorce, and the $5 million total that she and the kids received in the ensuing years, until each of the kids reached age 22. Now these were estimates off the top of my head from memory. So I went back and reviewed the numbers and it turns out that the real numbers are that I agreed to pay Betsy $1.8 million at the conclusion of the marriage. So $1.8 million at the start. However, I was $100,000 short of what I agreed to. More on that in a moment. And Betsy and the kids received a total of $4 million, a little bit more than $4 million, which includes the aforementioned $1.8 million and $618,000 for the kids' college funds and college costs. Below, I link to a PDF of the accounting. This accounting comes directly from a 2016 court case, one of many court battles I was in with Betsy. And anyone is free to dispute this accounting, but I think it's pretty accurate. So Betsy and the kids received a little bit more than $4 million not the five million dollars that I had estimated from memory in the first video. So that's my error. Now of course the counter to this is the money is good and all, but it doesn't make up for not having a full-time dad in the home. But remember I live just down the street from the kids in LaGrange, a bit more than a mile away. Then in 2011 we bought a house in Willowbrook, Illinois, which is an eight-minute drive away. Then in 2012 Betsy got remarried and moved about one hour north to a North Shore suburb. The kids were older by this point. Peter was in college. Tori was a senior in high school. Maddie was also in high school. Olivia was in middle school. I would make the one hour trip north at least once a week to see the kids, to see whoever wanted to hang out. Often that was just me and Peter hanging out. The girls typically wanted to hang with their friends. Teenage girls generally don't want to hang with their parents. They want to hang with their friends. But sometimes they would come out with me and Pete. And there really seemed to be no problem. Yes, there was one year when Tori would not come out and would not talk to me. That lasted a year. Then one day, Tori did come out. I said, great, you came out to lunch today, Tori. You haven't talked to me for a year. Has something changed? She said, no, one year of not talking to you is enough. Now I'm here. So I thought, cool, I've turned the corner with Tori. And it seems to have been a thousand percent great with Tori ever since for like the last 12 years or so. But here's the issue. Apparently they really do think that I abandoned the family. They think this because it took me more than two years to move to LaGrange, Illinois, where I could be just down the street. That's true. Maddie is right about that in a way. So let me go over the reasons why. And this is where the story really gets insane. Okay, so Betsy and I got separated in 2004, then divorced in 2005. Also, we were living in Virginia at that time, just outside of Washington, D.C. As part of the divorce agreement, I agreed to allow Betsy and the kids to move to the Chicago area. My plan was to follow Betsy and the kids there. This made quite a bit of sense because Betsy's family were there. 
and that's where Betsy is from. And I can work from anywhere. I'm a writer and a creative type. I create advertisements for a living. I can do that anywhere. So my plan was just to follow the kids from Virginia to Illinois. But I also agreed to just give Betsy essentially all the marital assets. I left the marriage with zero dollars. Well, three percent. That became zero after paying all the lawyers. Now, of course, I agreed to all of this. And I told you, I made literally every mistake in a divorce that a guy can possibly make. I thought giving Betsy $1.8 million at the get-go and leaving myself with nothing would buy peace. Wow, was I wrong. And everyone told me I was absolutely insane to agree to this. But I wanted Betsy to be a stay-at-home mom, as she had been. We agreed that that would be best for the kids. I wanted the kids to have a mom at home when they came home from school. So I didn't want Betsy to have to work while the kids were still young. And I wasn't worried about money. I was confident I could always make back the money. I grew up in Vermont and had kind of a hippie mindset. Money's never been my focus. I just do what I do and enough money just seems to roll in. What I did not count on was Betsy moving from Virginia to Illinois with the kids almost immediately. I couldn't move to Illinois immediately. She sold our house instantly, packed up the kids and left Virginia for Illinois, basically instantly. Yikes! I also did not predict that Betsy would issue subpoenas to all my clients to find out if I might be hiding money and assets from her. In other words, even though I agreed to give her everything, she didn't believe it. She thought there was more money to be found, money I was stashing away somewhere, or some hidden sources of income that she didn't know about. So she subpoenaed all of my clients. Her lawyers wanted to depose my clients. This caused me to lose most of my business. No client wants to be involved in a divorce legal proceeding or get deposed. So my clients ran for the tall grass fast. And by the way, she's doing this again. In the wake of this Maddie video flap, she's been phoning my clients again in hopes of torpedoing my current business, just like she was able to do in 2004 and 2005. So Betsy moved instantly from Virginia to Illinois during the separation, before the divorce was even completed. And I would make the trip to Illinois about once a month or every six weeks to see the kids. And the plan was to do this until I was in a financial position to be able to move to Illinois. And of course I was broke at that point. I had just let Betsy have all of the marital assets. Well, 97%. Now remember that $1.8 million that she was due at the conclusion of the marriage in 2005? Well, I was $100,000 short. I had agreed to give her an additional $100,000 on top of all of our marital assets. Well, I wasn't able to pay it because remember she had destroyed my business with all of her subpoenas. So she and her attorneys filed what is called a show cause petition with the court. A show cause petition. What is a show cause petition? Well, this means I must prove that I am not in contempt of court. And if I am in contempt of court, meaning if I don't pay up, pay the 100,000, I could go to jail for contempt of court. So I walked into court for this show cause hearing. I had no legal representation at that point because I was out of money and couldn't pay lawyers anymore because Betsy had torpedoed my business with her subpoenas to all of my clients. This judge was a woman by the name of Judge Leslie Alden. I knew the instant that she looked at me that I was dead in the water. She had my tax returns and bank statements. It looked to her like I was making quite a bit of money. But that was before my clients went away due to all of Betsy's subpoenas they were arriving at their offices from Betsy's legal team. Judge Alden bellowed at me. When will you pay Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her, Mr. Hart, she said from the bench. She sounded exactly like Judge Judy on TV. I answered, as soon as I can, Your Honor, I need to build my business back up. Judge Alden asked me again. When will you pay Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her, Mr. Hart? I answered, well, as soon as I can, Your Honor, I need to build my business back up. She asked me one more time, Mr. Hart, when will you pay Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? I answered, I don't know what else to say except I'll pay her the money as soon as I can. Her next words were, bailiff, remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. Now, I didn't care much about money when I let my ex, when I let Betsy have all her stuff, but I sure could have used $100,000 right then. Lesson. 
It's easy to sing kumbaya, give peace a chance, and to say you don't care about money until you actually need money to stay out of jail. The next thing you know, I was sitting in a large holding cell in the Fairfax County, Virginia jail with a large crowd of inmates waiting to be processed to include MS-13 gang members and members of the notorious R Street gang in Washington, D.C. I was still dressed in my business suit when I entered the holding cell. This large holding cell contained about 40 other inmates. The jail door clanked behind me. An enormous 300-pound black guy called Big Daddy said to me, Hey, what are you in here for with that nice suit, red tie, and shiny shoes? Some kind of computer fraud, bank fraud, or something? I said, Nah, I came up short on money I owe to my ex-wife. And I lost off into my story about what had just happened in court. Big Daddy, the 300-pound guy, called the other inmates over to hear the story. Big Daddy was clearly the dominant figure in the group. His voice was loud and booming. Plus, he was huge. So they all gathered round. Some of them looked like they were from the movie Menace to Society. Hey guys, come over here and listen to this, Big Daddy said. This story is great. I was sitting on a cement bench next to Big Daddy. We were all there for a few hours, because life in jail is not a fast-moving process. And they seemed to like me. They were all laughing, including the guy with the Nazi swastika tattoo on his face. They couldn't believe I agreed to pay my ex $1.8 million, plus $12,000 per month, and that I was still $100,000 short. Well, actually, I was more than $100,000 short. Judge Leslie Alden had also awarded Betsy attorney's fees, plus interest. So the bill I owed her at this point was $148,000. The guy who looked like he was out of menace to society, he says, what the F did you give her all that money for? and leave yourself with nothing. Then Big Daddy said, here's what you need to do. As soon as you get access to a phone, you need to call your ex. And in your sweetest possible voice, you need to say, dear, sweetie, honey, I can't pay you any money sitting in here. So let's make a deal. Then after a few hours in there, one of the guards calls out my name and I exit the holding cell area with the guards. A guard put me in handcuffs and led me to the processing area. I was seated and handcuffed to a metal chair next to an officer who was inputting data into a computer. He pulled up my record. He looked at me and said, Wow, what did you say to this judge to get one year in jail? Wait, what? I asked. I'm here for a year? What? Judge Alden had never said anything about this. All she had said was bailiff remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. And that was all she said. She never said anything about one year in jail. The officer read from the screen. Well, that's what it says here. You're getting one year in jail for contempt of court. It says you owe $148,000 to your ex-wife. How did you get $148,000 behind on your child support? Asked the officer. And I said, well, it's not really support. I paid my ex almost $1.7 million in assets that we had, which was pretty much all our assets, but I still owe her $148,000 to bring the total to $1.8 million in cash up front at the get-go. I also agreed to pay her $12,000 per month in support. So all in all, I'm $148,000 short in terms of immediate cash due. The officer looks at me. Why the hell did you agree to all that, he said. Who is the judge in this case? asked the officer. I answered, Judge Leslie Alden. Oh, that explains it, says the cop. Yup, that judge, she really hates men. After the officer finished inputting my info and giving me an inmate number, I was taken in cuffs to an area and given an orange jumpsuit. I changed into that. The cops then took my business clothing, my watch, my phone, my wallet, and everything I had and put it all in a plastic bag for safekeeping to be returned whenever I got out. I was then chained to 12 other inmates and we were led to our cell block. My cellmate was a Cherokee Indian who said he had been convicted of 47 felonies, most recently attempted murder, but we got along fine. So it really looked like Judge Leslie Alden wanted to send me a message. This was no white collar work release type program for nonviolent offenders. She put me in the worst hole in Fairfax County, apparently for a year. And it was actually underground, 
there were no windows. There are about 1,800 inmates in the Fairfax County Jail. Evidently, the reason Judge Leslie Alden sentenced me only to one year there is that's the maximum amount of time that you can spend in county jail. Any longer, and they have to move you to a state prison facility. So I was there for the max. And the way our cell block was set up is there was a common area that's linked to six cells where we slept. We were locked out of our sleeping cells all day, so we were all in the common area. So the 12 inmates in, the, in our cell block were all in the same small, all-cement common area all day. And we spent all day just shooting the bull. That's all there is to do in jail. There was one toilet and a shower out in the open in plain view of everyone. And you get used to it after a while. And I got along fine with everyone, even though most were there on serious violent felonies. And we spent a lot of time talking about how to get me out of there. In fact, that was the main topic of conversation. We concluded that what I needed to do was write a letter to the judge and offer a payment plan. We talked about how much I would offer. I thought maybe $2,000 a month. They all thought that was way too much. Problem is, if you can't come up with that money every month, you'll be right back here, said the MS-13 guy who is covered in tattoos, including tattoos on his face. Offer her $300 a month, said the white guy with a Nazi swastika tattoo on his neck who looked like Charles Manson. I settled on offering $1,000 per month to Judge Leslie Alden and then see what happens. Everyone in my cell block thought that was way too much. But I had to get out of there. I also figured that Judge Alden isn't stupid. She must know I can't pay my ex anything sitting in here. And my ex is supposed to be getting $12,000 a month. But I could not pay that sitting in there. So it was in everyone's interest to get me out of there pronto so I could start making money again. The problem is I could not get a pen. We were not allowed to have anything that could be used as a weapon. After three days in there, I got a visit from the head of the prison, the warden himself. He came all the way down to the deepest, darkest hole in the prison to find out what I had done to end up here. Out of the 1,800 inmates, he wanted to talk to me, Ben Hart. I guess my file had landed on his desk, and I guess I was the talk of the prison, and he wanted to hear the story. So how did you get $148,000 behind on your child support, he asked. And why did the judge put you in here? The warden was looking at me through these bars in this small window in the steel door of our cell block. I explained that I had not gotten $148,000 behind on my child support. And then I went through all the basic details of how I paid her close to $1.7 million plus $12,000 a month of support, and all payments were made. But I had fallen $100,000 short on the $1.8 million I had agreed to. Then the judge tacked on another $48,000 for Betsy's attorney's fees and for interest. So I just wasn't able to come up with that final $100,000 plus $48,000. Who was the judge, the warden asked. Judge Leslie Alden, I answered. That explains it, said the warden. She's a real man-hater. Looks like you really pissed her off. He paused. He looked at his file of papers on me. Then he said, even though you've been sentenced here, I'm moving you to work release. Trouble is, we don't have any jobs for you that will help you pay off this $148,000 debt. The jobs we have pay $7 an hour. People who are here because they are behind on their child support pay their child support that way. But this is not going to help you get out of your situation. But let me see what I can do about this. I can't have you down here. About a day later, guards arrive and they take me to the work release facility. This was low security, so I was able to get a pen and a piece of paper and write a letter to Judge Leslie Alden with my proposal to pay my ex $1,000 per month toward the $148,000 that I owed her, plus keep up with my other obligations under the divorce decree. I didn't hear anything back. I thought, well, I guess I'm here for a year. I started to accommodate myself to this reality. It's amazing how humans can get used to almost any reality over time. Whatever your situation is becomes the new normal, the new baseline for existence. And I met some very interesting people in there, including a high-powered attorney who was in there on some kind of fraud. I became friends with a tall black kid named Alan. He was about 6'6 and was a martial arts expert. When he wanted to watch a particular TV show, he would stand in front of the TV in a martial arts pose so that no one would dare try to change the channel. 
And he and I would have contests to find out who is the, quote, better man. We would have push-up contests, chin-up contests, play ping-pong, monopoly, and chess. Pretty much any game we could think of. And he was a good kid, but he was very rambunctious. He was maybe age 18 or 19. And I'm not sure what he was in there for, probably marijuana possession or something like that. And what he liked to do is practice his karate kicks and punches that would stop one inch from my nose. And I told him, Alan, stop doing that. See all these cameras around here? They're going to think you're violent. They're going to take you out of here and put you down in the hole. But Alan was a good kid, just had a lot of energy. And about half the guys, I would say at least half the guys in the work release program in the jail were there because they could not make child support or alimony payments. America's jails are filled with these guys, so-called deadbeat dads. And I did not realize until then that yes, we do indeed still have debtors' prisons in America. About five days had passed since I had sent my letter to Judge Leslie Alden, offering to pay Betsy $1,000 per month toward the $148,000 I owed her. Again, this would be an additional $1,000 per month on top of the $12,000 per month I was already obligated to pay under the divorce decree. I hadn't heard anything from Judge Alden. Didn't know if the judge even received my letter. I assumed not. But then one day around 5 p.m., I was on my bunk bed reading, and I heard a guard yell, Hart! Benjamin Hart! Benjamin Hart! Is Benjamin Hart in here? Yeah, that's me, I said. Come get your shit and get out of here, the guard said. So I went to the booth where they had my stuff. It was all in a plastic bag. My business suit was wrinkled in a mess, but everything was in there. My wallet, my watch, my phone. I called my girlfriend, Wanda, who had become my wife a couple months later. I figured any girlfriend who would put up with this is definitely wife material. I was broken in jail, but she had not run for the tall grass to disappear. I told her I was being released and asked her if she could pick me up. I had been there for eight days and eight nights, and I got out of my orange jumpsuit and back into my wrinkled business suit, and the warden was there to meet me on my way out. He had a bemused look on his face. You'd better write fast and write every day to keep up with your payments, he said. I don't want to see you back here. Thank you, I said. Thank you for getting me out of the hole and up here. I'm not planning on coming back. The problem was, I still had to pay my ex $12,000 per month plus now $1,000 per month, for a total of $13,000 per month. This was no joke, especially since I had no business anymore. All my clients were gone. I left jail with $5 in the bank, no clients, and no business. Wanda was my girlfriend. I had met her at a karaoke bar. She's an immigrant from Laos. I call her my best girl. After jail, Wanda and I existed by maxing out my credit cards and Wanda's credit cards to the tune of $65,000 while I rebuilt. I needed to figure out a business that did not involve having clients that Betsy could subpoena and depose. So I developed an online marketing education business. I charged people $38 per month for my online marketing seminars. And I got the business up to about a thousand students pretty quickly. By April of 2007, I thought I was financially strong enough to move to Illinois. Oh, and that $1,000 per month extra, additional, that I was supposed to pay toward my $148,000 debt? Well, that was temporary. To stay out of jail, I had to promise to Judge Alden that I would pay it all off in 24 months, or it would be back in the slammer for me. And by the way, when I say I paid Betsy $12,000 per month, that's kind of shorthand. Here's where that number comes from, because Betsy is challenging this number. Well, here's what it was. $4,000 per month for alimony, $4,600 per month for child support until age 22 for each child, $800 per month for the college fund, $1,000 per month for life insurance, $400 per month toward Betsy's health insurance, $1,000 per month for health insurance for the kids, and there were about $1,000 in monthly costs for out-of-pocket medical expenses. Medical costs, by the way, included not just the usual things that we consider to be medical costs, things like broken leg or need some stitches, have a fever, things like that. These out-of-pocket medical costs also included counseling and therapy sessions for the kids, eyeglasses, contact lenses, braces, and so forth. And these were not covered by insurance. Betsy also seemed to like to rack up extra unnecessary medical costs just to stick it to me. 
constantly taking the kids to doctors who were out of network, so weren't covered by insurance. And we actually had a lawsuit over this in 2016. So there was that aspect. So it was really more than $12,000 per month for support. So Wanda and I were able to move out there in April of 2007. We move into the Homestead Inn in Lombard, Illinois, while we look for a place to live in LaGrange near the kids. Betsy is warning me in emails and frantic text messages not to move there. She says I'll regret it if I do. Then one Saturday, I think it was the second Saturday we were there, I swing by the house to pick up the kids. We go to breakfast and putt-putt golf. After breakfast, Tori did not want to go to putt-putt golf. She wanted to be dropped off at home. So I dropped her off at home. It was then me, Pete, Maddie, and Olivia at Putt-Putt Golf, and I bring them home to Betsy's house. When I arrive, Betsy is standing there. I get out of the car. Betsy walks over to talk to me. She shows me her iPod. iPods were a big thing in 2007. She informs me that she's been recording all of our conversations, including when I guess I called her a bunch of names, and we've been having a lot of nasty conversations. I didn't really know what might be on that iPod. And as she was holding the iPod into my face, I guess to record what was happening, I quickly snatched the iPod out of her hand and headed for the car. Betsy then jumped on my back as I was trying to get into the car, and I managed to shake her off. But she dives into the car after me and is sprawled across my lap trying to get the iPod. I toss her out of the car as I'm taking off. And this is important because Maddie believes, and I'll quote Maddie's text message just the other day on this, Maddie says about her video that, quote, I could have made you look so much worse. I didn't post anything about when you forced mom into the car and drove away with her, end quote. I didn't force Betsy into the car. She jumped on my back to try to get the iPod and followed me into the car. Why would I try to force Betsy into the car? I'm trying to get away from Betsy with the iPod. But this is the story that the kids have been told by Betsy. And they probably saw some commotion, some sort of struggle, which was Betsy on my back trying to get the iPod and following me into the car. And on the way back to the homestead, I throw the iPod out the window. And I'm told by my lawyer later that that was a big mistake because surreptitious recording of conversations is a crime in Illinois. Meanwhile, Betsy went to the police in Western Springs and filed a domestic violence charge against me. She also filed a charge for theft of the iPod. Wanda and I went to a restaurant called Miller's Pub, which is right next to the homestead where we were staying, and we saw the police show up. We watch. After the police leave, we go to our room quickly to get all our stuff. The front desk tells me the police are looking for me. So we decide to drive to Maryland where Wanda's family lives and regroup. We stayed there until December. We were basically in hiding. I needed time to build up my internet business so I could return to Illinois and hire lawyers. And I stopped paying Betsy any support for a while while I built up my finances. By December, I felt I had the finances to be able to pay off Betsy, all the back support, plus hire a lawyer. The problem, of course, was that I knew that if I showed up in Illinois, I would be arrested. There was a warrant out for my arrest. So Wanda and I snuck back into Illinois. I hired a lawyer. Then I turned myself in, spent the night in jail, got out on bond by putting up $300, and began a series of six-month legal proceedings. The judge and the prosecutors in this case said my snatching of the iPod out of Betsy's hand was technically assault and theft. So in exchange for no trial and no conviction on the matter, I agreed with the court to attend some conflict de-escalation classes and agree to pay Betsy $120 for the iPod. The conflict de-escalation classes were actually very good. They were taught by a retired hostage negotiator. Everyone should take this class. There would be far fewer deaths from road rage incidents and whatnot. The issues people fight over are really just so stupid 99% of the time. We're all going to be dead soon. Is the issue that you're fighting over really that important? Wouldn't it be better just to enjoy life and to be thankful for every day that you have on this beautiful ball we call Earth? Meanwhile, Betsy had obtained a protective order and had filed a motion to prevent visitation. Here is Betsy's motion to prevent visitation. It's actually titled Motion to Strike Petitioner's Petition for Visitation and Motion for Sanctions. This all cost me another $30,000 or so to overcome. Betsy's goal here was for me not to be able to see the kids at all, ever. And the kids, of course, had no understanding that all this was going on. To them, it looked like I had abandoned them. 
and to them it looked like some scuffle had occurred between me and Betsy on the street outside her house. And Betsy, I guess, told them I was trying to drag Betsy into the car. I guess for the purpose of kidnapping her? What sense does that make? The kids, of course, had little or no clue about all these legal battles going on. How I was both fighting financially and in the courts for more than two years to reestablish my right as a dad to have a relationship with my kids. I had no idea that Betsy would take every legal step imaginable to prevent me from moving to Illinois. And I ultimately overcame all of this. But it is easy to see why the girls think their dad abandoned the family. They had no idea all this was going on. And who knows what Betsy was telling them at home. The family law court in Chicago rejected Betsy's motion to prevent visitation. Also threw out her protective order. In December of 2007, Wanda and I moved into a rental property in LaGrange, a bit more than a mile down the street. I then saw the kids at least once a week, often more. I saw my son Peter throughout the week. I generally saw the girls once a week. And of course I was available any time they wanted to hang out. And as I said, in 2011, Wanda and I bought a house in Willowbrook, Illinois, which is an eight-minute drive from the kids. It's a nice house, has a swimming pool, with a water slide. But hostilities from Betsy were still high. And then she got remarried in 2012, and she moved one hour north. And the kids were older by this point. Pete was in college, attending Columbia College in downtown Chicago. Tori was a senior in high school, I think. Maddie was also in high school. Olivia was in middle school at that point. And at least once a week, I would make the trip one hour north to see the kids. Well, whoever wanted to hang out. I would often swing by Columbia College in downtown Chicago to pick up Peter. We would then head up the North Shore to pick up the girls, or whichever girls wanted to hang out. The girls were teenagers by this point. They often didn't want to hang out with their dad. They preferred to hang out with their friends. But sometimes they did go to breakfast, lunch, dinner, and or to a movie that we were going to. Everyone was pretty much free to do what they wanted to do. Hang out with me and Pete. Or not. At any rate, as the years passed, I thought all the nastiness had pretty much dissipated. As I said, Betsy got remarried in 2012, married a cancer research doctor who founded and runs a cancer research institute that's affiliated with Northwestern University. They live in a $2.2 million house. She really has nothing to still be angry about. For years now, I thought we had pretty much gotten past all of this nastiness and bad feeling. Yes, 2005 through 2007 was rough, and really through 2008. But all that just seems so long ago to me now. And as I said, just last year, Betsy invited me into her house for a glass of wine while I waited for one of the girls to arrive. Betsy said there's no need for you to sit in the driveway. Just come in and come on in. And we had a pleasant conversation. Last year, Betsy and I were in Boulder, Colorado for my youngest daughter Olivia's graduation from the University of Colorado. And we had a very good time. Hung out with Olivia. Joked about this and that. Joked about a woman who wanted us to pay $750 each to attend her daughter's graduation party. And I guess Betsy paid the woman $300 for the party. And I'm like, are you kidding? I paid zero. I just showed up. Who charges people to attend their daughter's graduation party? So Betsy and I were joking about that while sipping wine at this party. But honestly, everything seemed fine between us until Maddie launched her video barrage against me a few weeks ago, which is really just out of the blue, out of nowhere. So I had to answer that. Just this past Christmas, we were all having a great time laughing and joking at dinner. But now the girls apparently have rallied around Maddie. I don't see why anybody needs to take sides. Peter's staying out of it. He says he's not following it, doesn't even really know what's going on. Of course he knows what's going on, but he just wants to stay out of it. So that's basically where things are at the moment. I'm not sure why all this bad feeling is suddenly coming out now. There's really no need for all this negative energy. There never was a need for it. My hope is for everything to go back to the way it was this past Christmas, with everyone happy and getting along, and the way it has been for, well, since 2008 or so. Okay.